four. And this is, this is just one of those subjects that could continue just going and going and growing and growing. And, and uh, we're on week eight, and what a blessing it's been to me. And uh, I know I have at least one more, but I won't uh, be doing that right away, just sometime in the near future. One more lesson. But again, we're picking up where we left off a couple weeks back now, just because of different things going on. But we're studying the pre-tribulation rapture. And again, most of you folks here are very familiar with the subject at hand. And uh, kind of recap real quickly, just for a few moments, of where we left off last week. Because be honest with you, excuse me, last time we studied this, uh, be honest with you, I didn't even really get too much in regards to the rapture last time we touched this. And uh, what we did, or what I did, was uh, drew a comparison, and we contrasted the truths found in the Old Testament compared to the truths found in the New Testament. And the reason I did that is very relevant and important for you understanding the emphasis of the pre-tribulation rapture. And again, so what I showed you last time we studied this subject, that in the Old Testament, no one was born again. And that's important to understand. Uh, the new birth comes by the gospel of the grace of God, and that's not preached until the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that means everyone in the Old Testament, they weren't born again. And therefore, they were not individually the sons of God. Right. The nation as a whole was called God's children, his son, but not individually. That new birth happens after the cross of Calvary. We also showed you, I also showed you, uh, that nobody preached the death, burial, and resurrection of Lord Jesus Christ again until after the resurrection. That's when his own disciples remembered his words and they went forth at that time preaching what we call the gospel that we preach, the gospel of the grace of God. But no one up until that point ever preached that. And again, that's important. I showed you also that in the Old Testament they had personal righteousness. They did not get imputed unto them the righteousness of Jesus Christ like you and I have. And that's a big difference. Again, that's not available until Jesus Christ sheds his blood, is buried, and resurrected. And again, all I'm trying to get you to see is the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. I showed you that in the Old Testament, the Bible is very clear that they live by their faith. But we as Christians, in all honesty, we're kept by the faith of Jesus Christ. And that's a huge difference. And another point I showed you is they didn't have eternal security. And that's also connected with the doctrine of salvation. In the Old Testament, they either died righteous or they died wicked. And I showed you according to the Bible that that righteous man could turn from his righteousness. He could commit iniquity and all of his righteousness wouldn't it be remembered. But the same was true in regards to that wicked man. That wicked man could turn from his wickedness and then follow God and God's law and be considered righteous. Ladies and gentlemen, I know the vast majority of you know this, but maybe someone watching online or listening doesn't understand this. You could never earn the righteousness of God. Amen. The righteousness of God comes by Jesus Christ. Amen. And again, so all of this in consideration, and that's what we did in part seven, and we ran all those references. But that's why it's so important to get the doctrine of the rapture of the church correct. Because I was gonna, hopefully I'm going to show you tonight that I'm going to present to you is the number one reason there has to be a pre-tribulation rapture is because it affects the doctrine of salvation and those doctrines that are connected with salvation. Now a lot of Christians don't even understand the day they got saved, everything that occurred. I know I didn't understand that for many years. But there's more than just justification that occurs. There's imputation occurs. And again, that's getting the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. There's the new birth there. And all I'm saying is the day that you trusted Jesus Christ, there's a whole bunch of things that were connected with your salvation that are New Testament doctrine. And again, this is why it's so imperative that we understand that in the time of Jacob's trouble, which most people call the tribulation, salvation is different. 
And because it's different, that's how you know there has to be a pre-tribulation rapture where God's going to take his church away from this world before that time frame. And again, so that's the premise for this study. And hopefully by the end of that, you'll see that. Now, first of all, in regards to the time of Jacob's trouble and the tribulation, the first thing, and this is very simple truth, but you need to grasp and understand, they're preaching a different gospel. They're preaching a different gospel. Now, that is very important in when you consider Pauline understanding of the gospel of the grace of God. Let's look here this evening in Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. And we have looked numerous times at this chapter here is dealing with the time of Jacob's trouble. We don't need to do that again. If you don't understand that, just go back and listen to the first seven weeks and you'll, you'll figure that out. But right here, smack dab in the middle of this time of Jacob's trouble, look what it says in verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations and then shall the end come. Now, I've heard a whole bunch of bad Bible uh, um, discussions or, or, or studies on this particular verse. People use this verse and see, they say, see, the gospel, the grace of God's got to be preached through all the world before the Lord's going to come back. That's not what it said. First of all, it's not the gospel, the grace of God. Did you notice what it said there? And it said in verse 14, and this gospel of the kingdom. Ladies and gentlemen, we're not preaching the gospel of the kingdom. We're preaching the gospel of the grace of God. But in the time of Jacob's trouble, they will be preaching the gospel of the kingdom. You know why? Because the kingdom is about to come. That's the very next thing that happens after the time of Jacob's trouble. The Lord Jesus Christ comes back from heaven. He's going to come back to this earth and he's going to set up his kingdom. And that's what's being preached. Now, let me show you. Look at Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14. And obviously in Revelation chapter 14, we're smack dab in the time of Jacob's trouble. We're in the time of the tribulation. And the first point is simple, that they're preaching a different gospel. Revelation chapter 14. Now look at verse 6. The Bible says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having, watch it, the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. You see there, here's an angel flying through the heavens. And it doesn't say he's preaching the gospel of the grace of God. It says he's preaching the everlasting gospel. You say, what is that, preacher? Well, I'm glad you asked. Look at the very next verse. Saying, here's what he's preaching. Here's the everlasting gospel. Saying, with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment is come. And worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea, and the fountains of waters. Do you see anything in there about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ? Do you see anything in there? Listen, you need to be born again. No, he's preaching judgment's coming. And it's called the everlasting gospel. So again, we've seen in Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, they were preaching the gospel of the kingdom. We've seen in Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 and 7, that an angel is preaching the everlasting gospel. Now, I know this is very elementary to you, but again, maybe someone's listening or watching who doesn't know this. The gospel that we're commanded to preach is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where Paul declares, I'm here to declare unto you the gospel. And then you read down in verses 3 and 4. I'm just going to summarize the verses there. He says how that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture and was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's the gospel that you and I are commanded to preach to a lost and dying world. What is that? That Jesus Christ took their place on the cross of Calvary. But he's not dead. He's alive. He's at the right hand of the Father. That's the gospel. The death, 
burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is not what we read in Matthew chapter 24, Revelation chapter 14. So again, I'm being redundant. But in the time of Jacob's trouble, they're preaching another gospel. That's how you know that the church is going to be taken out of here, going to be raptured. You say, why? Because if the church wasn't taken out of here, if the church wasn't raptured, then it's a violation, according to the Apostle Paul, of what he wrote to the Galatians. Look at Galatians chapter 1. Look at Galatians chapter 1. Again, ladies and gentlemen, this is why it's important to rightly divide the word of truth. The vast majority, probably 90% if not more, of heresy... A false doctrine is Bible verses applied to the wrong people. Again, you talk about water baptism for salvation. You talk about losing your salvation. You talk about all these other things. Most of the times that people are teaching that, they have Bible for it. The problem is it wasn't written to the church or to us. Now, we know that Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles, and Paul's writing here to the Galatians, and look what he says here in Galatians chapter 1. Again, just to keep you on track, what I'm saying, I'm saying that our gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what I showed you, according to Matthew 24 and Revelation chapter 14, in the time of Jacob's trouble, that is not what they are preaching. Now look what it says here in Galatians chapter 1. Galatians 1, 6, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. He said, listen, someone else is preaching another gospel, but it's not really another gospel. They've perverted the gospel, the true gospel, which we just read. Look what he says there in verse eight. But though we, now watch how this Bible's written. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you, that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. That angel in Revelation chapter 14 is an angel of the Lord. He's preaching for the Lord there. He wasn't preaching the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection. So you're stuck with two options. If the church is going on during that time frame, then that angel should be accursed. Or, as I presented to you, the church is not in the time of Jacob's trouble. And God dispense more truth. That's why we're dispensationalists. And there's a different gospel preached during the time of Jacob's trouble. Amen. And again, ladies and gentlemen, this is why I emphasize, and I don't think some people understand why I emphasize that when we witness, when we go to the street corner, or when you knock on a door, or when you stand in the pulpit of a congregation, you better be careful when it comes to the gospel that you're preaching the right gospel. It's a serious thing. We had a little discussion earlier today, just right before a guy here in the pulpit, and just talking about repentance. And listen, and ladies and gentlemen, we've done this, the study on it. What is not the gospel is repenting and turning from your sins. You can't turn from all your sins. Biblical repentance for salvation, listen to me carefully, is realizing who you are, a sinner, and you're going to die and go to hell, but you turn to Jesus Christ, you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you're saying what? And what he did for you on the cross of Calvary. And you receive him by faith. So you better be careful with your words, and that's why I emphasize when you're, when you're preaching salvation, it's a very important thing that we don't Pervert the gospel, as Paul said. And what we see here, and again, Matthew 24 and Revelation, um, yeah, and Revelation 16, they were preaching a different gospel. Now, I won't belabor the point, but many of you here, the vast majority of you heard my testimony. But May 28, 2000, I was a lost sinner who did never open the Bible in my life. I couldn't tell you who Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John was. Had no idea. I had no idea about an Old Testament, no idea about a New Testament, but my chief opened the Bible there in Greece, and he showed me basically the Roman road. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. He showed me, for, uh, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. He showed me the wages of sin is death, and then he explained to me, according to Revelation 21, verse 8, that's not just physical death, 
but eternal damnation. And I sat there and knew that every word that he said was true. See, I was searching for God and didn't know it. I try to fill my heart with everything. I try to fill my heart with liquor and, and money and power and everything the world had to offer. But you know, at the end of all those things, I was left wanting. But when I heard that I was a sinner and I knew that he then told me the greatest story ever told. He told me the glad tidings, how that Jesus Christ left his throne from heaven. He was born of a virgin a little over 2,000 years ago. He lived the perfect life. He went to the cross of Calvary. He died for my sins. And if I'd receive him, if I'd believe on him, he would save me. And that day, May 28th, I fell to my knees and I said, Lord, I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. Lord, I pray, pray that you'll save this old sinner. I believe that you died for me. And I don't remember exactly what I said. It was something of that sort. But listen to me, that day I received Jesus Christ. That day I trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. If a person has not done that, if there's never been a day, place, and time when they received the Lord Jesus Christ, then listen to me, just as Jesus told that old fair, or the religious person, Nicodemus, in John chapter 3, ye must be born again. Religion can't save you. Being a good person can't save you. Quit drinking can't save you. Quit doing drugs can't save you. The only thing that can save you is the Lord Jesus Christ. And that day he saved this old sinner. But you know why? I heard the gospel, the grace of God. I heard the gospel that Jesus Christ died for my sins. And if I'd trust him, if I'd receive him, he would save me. And that day, that's exactly what I did. So again, First point, very simple. Why there must be pre-tribulation rapture is they are preaching a different gospel. And according to Paul, during this time frame, during this dispensation, if anyone preaches a different gospel, he says, let them be accursed. Secondly, it's very closely connected, but salvation is different. Look at Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. I'm going to have to move. Even though we're here to midnight, I don't want to be up here to midnight. Matthew 24, salvation is different. Look at verse 13. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Simple question tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Are you trying to endure unto the end to be saved? No. I'm not. But in the time of Jacob's trouble, they are instructed to endure unto the end to be saved. Now let me let's put a little bit of a, a little bit of meat on that statement. Look at Revelation chapter 12. Not only is the gospel different, salvation is different in the time of Jacob's trouble. Revelation chapter 12. Watch it carefully. Again, we're now entering back into the time of Jacob's trouble here. Revelation chapter 12, look at verse 17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. Watch it. Which kept the commandments of God and had the testimony of Jesus Christ. You see that? Kept the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Look at Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14. Same thing, look at here in verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. You say, what saints? Tribulation saints. Those that are living during those days, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that what? the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. There it is a second time. Now you notice there in regards to these saints that live in the time of Jacob's trouble, he connects them there and he says, here is the patience of the saints. Look at James chapter five, if you would. Hebrews, James. By the way, you know who James is written to, right? James chapter 1, verse 1, it's written to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. 
Last time I looked around this room, I don't think anyone belongs to any of those 12 tribes. <laughs> That's the Jews. <laughs> yeah, amen, brother. <laughs> That's in spirit. You know. <laughs> James chapter 5, remember we just read, here's the patience of the saints. Talking about the saints in the tribulation. James chapter 5. Now watch it. Verse 10. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Don't miss it now. Watch it. Behold, we count them happy, which what? Endure. Remember that in Matthew chapter 24? You endure unto the end, you shall be saved. Here's the patience they endure. Keep reading. You have heard of the patience of who? The patience of Job. And have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of a tender mercy. Again, I've told you this before in this study, but you know how many chapters Job has? Job has 42 chapters. You know what Job's problem is? Satan himself is persecuting Job. Just like you read in Revelation where that dragon chases that woman into the wilderness who persecutes that remnant, what you have is the book of Job is a picture of the time of Jacob's trouble for those three and a half years or 42 months where Satan persecutes that tribulation saint, just like he did Job. But that's in regards to the Jews there. Again, to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. Again, let's build on this a little bit more. Look at Revelation chapter 22. In case you are of this generation and going to be 2020 here in a few hours, let me rehearse where we're at. There's no commercials, and I know sometimes people start daydreaming. We're talking about why salvation is different in the time of the tribulation. And showing you those verses where they had to keep the commandments and faith, the commandments and faith, and they had the patience of Job in those 42 months. And look here in Revelation chapter 22. Look at verse 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. Two questions for you, ladies and gentlemen. You as a born-again, Bible-believing Christian, just as a born-again Christian, do you need the tree of life for eternal life? No, your eternal life comes through Jesus Christ. But somebody, some point in time, had to keep commandments so they could be partakers of the tree of life. And I'm showing you who that is. It's those saints in the tribulation. And when they endure to the end, and they keep those commandments and have the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, then they're given right to the tree of life. You say, why? Because no one's born again in the tribulation. No one's sealed unto the day of redemption in the tribulation. Salvation changes. Salvation is different. Look at the songs that they sing. Revelation 15. Revelation 15. I understand a lot of this is turning and doctrine, but ladies and gentlemen, I love this stuff. And hopefully by the end of it, if you don't got it all figured out, at least you can say, praise God for my salvation that is complete in Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm glad, I'm glad that we're not going to be here during the time of Jacob's trouble. The worst time the world's ever seen. And listen to me, we're living in a very volatile world. We could wake up tomorrow. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, I'm talking about even before the rapture of the church. We could wake up tomorrow and every one of our lives could be turned upside down. Just like they did in Britain during the Great Depression, like they did in America. All of a sudden, your money's worth nothing. You have no idea what tomorrow brings. But this I do know. I know where I'm going to spend eternity. I know that it's not dependent on me. Thank God for my salvation that's in Jesus Christ. Again, let's look at the songs that they sing. Revelation chapter 15. Look at verse 3. And this is talking about those tribulation saints there. And it says, and they sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. 
Don't you find it interesting? They sing the song of Moses. You know, Moses, law, commandments. Sing the song of Moses. And they sing the song of the Lamb. Again, over and over and over again, you see it in the book of Revelation. Look at Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. Look at verse 11. Oh, let's go back to verse 10. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength, and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the cues of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him. Who's the him? It's the accuser of the brethren. It's the devil. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony that they love not their lives unto the death. You know what that is? You must endure unto the end. So they overcame that dragon by the blood of the lamb and their testimony. All right, let me show you this. One more time, look in Malachi chapter 4, and I want you to get this one. You say, what is all those things you're showing me about the commandments and faith and the song of Moses and the Lord? Let me just summarize. You know what it is? It's faith and obedience. You say obedience and what? Whatever the Lord told them. And in this case, don't take the mark of the beast, endure until the end. It's faith and obedience. Now, this is an important passage. Look at Malachi chapter 4. The Lord, again, he's just written this book in just an amazing way, if you'll just study it out. Malachi chapter 4, we're going to read a few verses, get a little bit of the context. Look at verse 1. Malachi 4, 1. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble, and that day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. You know what that sounds like to me? Judgment. Sounds like what that, that angel was preaching in heaven. Judgment's coming in that day. Now keep reading. Look at verse 2. But unto you that fear my name, don't miss it, shall the Son, that is S-U-N, shall the Son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. And of course, we know you compare Scripture with Scripture. That's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. He's pictured as the Son of righteousness. And what we did and we read and studied in the Mount Transfiguration, you know how the Lord Jesus Christ's face shined? As the Son. And that Mount Transfiguration there, who was there? Moses and Elijah was there. It's a picture when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back and he's glorified and he comes back to take judgment on this world. He's compared as the son of righteousness. Now keep reading. Verse two, but unto you that fear my name shall the son of righteousness rise with healing in his wings and you shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. Now watch it. And he shall tread down the wicked. For there shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Here we go, verses 4 and 5 and 6. Remember ye the law of who? Moses, my servant, which I command you, command, um, commanded unto him in Horeb, for all who? For all Israel, don't miss that, with the statues and judgment. Verse 5, behold, I will send, un, send you who? Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. So verse 4, you have Moses. Verse 5, you have Elijah. Those are the two witnesses of Revelation chapter 11. That's why they're with the Lord Jesus Christ at the Mount Transfiguration. Again, we know that Peter wants to build tabernacles unto them because I believe it's going to happen during the Feast of Tabernacles when the Lord Jesus Christ is going to send, come back and set up his kingdom there. Now, what I want to draw your attention to, though, 
is back to verse 4. Look what he says. So here's the point. The context of Malachi chapter 4 is what? Where would you place this in a timeline? You would place this in the time of Jacob's trouble. You would place this during the tribulation. Again, you see the Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to come back as the son of righteousness. You see the two witnesses there. And right smack dab in the middle, don't miss what he says in verse 4. Remember ye the law of Moses. Isn't that interesting? I thought the law was done away with. It is for the church. But you know what he told those Jews? Remember this was written to Israel? Remember ye the law of Moses and the statues and judgments. You know what's going to open the eyes of those Jews to the Antichrist? What's going to open the eyes of those Jews to the Antichrist is that Old Testament law. And that's why God tells them to keep the commandments and have faith. It's that Old Testament law that's going to open their eyes. Now quickly, we won't run all these references. You say, like what? Well, it's going to open their eyes to the mark of the beast. Now we've de dealt with this more in detail in the future. I don't believe that the mark of the beast is going to be RFID chip under your skin, despite what the vast majority of the world says. You know Why? Because what's our final authority? Science, news media, or the Word of God? It's the Word of God. You know what the Bible says over and over about the mark? It's on the outside. It's a tattoo. It's the ink blot. And I believe that mark is going to be an RFID tattoo that everyone can visibly see, and you'll go scan your, your hand or you'll scan your forehead, but it's a mark. And guess what those Jews are going to remember? Those Jews are going to remember the law. You know what the law says in Leviticus 19, 28? And ye shall not make any cutting in your flesh for the dead, nor, listen, print any mark upon you. I am the Lord. So you know what the Antichrist is going to do? He's going to tell the world, listen to me. Well, we don't know what happened to all these people. I know it's the worst time in the earth, but I promise you peace. I promise you safety, but we got to get control of this world. So I need everyone to take the mark. And if you don't take the mark, you can't buy, you can't sell, and you can't trade. Guess what the droves are going to do? They're going to line up at the local government office, stick out their hand and their forehead, and they're going to receive the mark. You say, why? Without it, they'll starve. But that Jew, he's going to remember the law, and the law forbids him to do it. And that's why they have to keep the commandments and the faith that law is going to open their eyes. There's something wrong with this guy. Secondly, you know what else is going to open their eyes to? It's going to open their eyes to the image that the Antichrist is going to set up. We won't read it for time's sake, but sometime read in Revelation chapter 13, verses 11 through 15. The Antichrist there, the dragon there, he's going to make them, the people of the earth, make an image to the first beast that received a deadly wound and was healed. And guess what they're going to have to do with that image? They're going to have to worship it. And boy, will they worship it. You know why they'll worship it? Because that dragon gives power to that image, both to speak and come alive. You've never seen something like that before. And this whole world's going to be like, who is this man? And they're going to fall down at what? At that image. And they're going to worship it. You say, where did you read that at before? You ever read in the book of Daniel with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego where Nebuchadnezzar set up an image? He made all the world to bow down to it when the music played. You know what you're reading about? A picture, a prophecy of what's coming to happen with the Antichrist. But you know what I read there? There was three Hebrew boys who knew the law. Listen to me. Who knew the law? And they refused to bow down and worship. And although they were cast into the fire, the fourth man as the Son of God showed up and kept him from burning. That's a picture of those Jews being delivered from the wrath of the Antichrist. You say when? In the time of Jacob's trouble. Boy, I'm telling you, this book is, this is more than you can ever imagine. You say, where do they get that from? The law. 
Exodus chapter 20, verse 4. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. The reason they won't bow down to that image is because the law forbids them. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, you say, what are you saying? I'm telling you, it's not just faith in the Lord Jesus Christ because it's different economy. It's the commandments, it's the law and faith. And again, so what we see here is salvation is different. Now, coming down and trying to land the plane shortly. Let me ask you a question. In all seriousness, if salvation is the same, which obviously you know by now I don't believe it is, at the time of Jacob's trouble, if salvation is the same, and they have eternal security just like you and I do, then what's the big deal about the pre-tribulation rapture? There isn't. If all the doctrines are the same, if salvation is the same, if eternal security is the same, then listen to me, I wouldn't be being such a throwing a fit over this doctrine as I am. But as we saw, they're not. You say, what do you mean, preacher? Well, if salvation's the same, and eternal security's the same, now, now think with me. Why not just take the mark so you can feed your family? Why not? You say, well, I don't want to because I want to bring glory to God. Okay, I agree. Praise the Lord for that. I agree 100%. We should follow God if it's a salvation issue or not. But again, let's bring this conversation back to reality. Listen, I'm not being mean. You can't even get Christians to come to church faithfully. You, you can't get Christians to read their Bible faithfully. Do you realize, and I, again, I'm not slighting anyone. Do you realize there's Christians that are just as saved as you and I? That have never witnessed to a stranger in their life? Amen. And you're going to tell me <laughs> that in the worst time the world has ever seen, that every Christian is going to refuse the mark. I don't buy it. They're going to sign up by the droves to get the mark. And that's why God's got to take his church out. Because he's promised us things in this dispensation that violates his promise in the time of Jacob's trouble. And God's law, God's word will never be broken. And he's written in such a manner where the pre-tribulation rapture has to occur. Because in the tribulation, salvation is different. Because in salvation, they're preaching a different gospel. And again, just consider that. If it all is the same, then Christians could take the mark or Christians could refuse. But the reason they don't and the reason that people even believe that no, they can't take the mark because the Bible is very clear. And that leads me to my third and almost final point. Salvation is conditional in the tribulation. Amen. Let me show you a couple of references just to help you out quickly. Look at Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. By the way, I just thought of this while you're thinking, uh, turning to Matthew chapter 24. And as I was turning to Genesis, I'm not sure why, but you want to understand what they were, they're going to be preaching at the time of Jacob's trouble? Do you remember when we studied that John the Baptist could have been the fulfillment of Elijah if they would have received Jesus Christ is their king, but they didn't. So he said, therefore, because you've refused, now Elijah must come. You want to know what they're preaching in the tribulation time, Jacob's trouble? Go back and study what John was preaching. John was preparing the hearts of the nation of Israel to receive their king. Just like Moses and Elijah is going to be doing, preparing the hearts of the nation of Israel to receive their king. Now again, salvation is conditional and and ladies and gentlemen, this is where people get all these verses and they try to put them all on the church. And this is, again, as many preachers said, this is how you come up with, with a, you know, theology casserole and everything just mixed in there. Now, that's not how the Bible's written. It's written to rightly divide and you have to ask who it's written to. But salvation is conditional, just not for you and I. Look at Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, we'll pick up in verse 45. Well, 44, the Bible says, Therefore, 
Be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Again, that's the second advent. Verse 45, who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household, to give them meat in due season? Watch it. Blessed is the servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you, that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. Don't miss it now. Verse 48. But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come in the day when he looketh not for him, and in the hour that he is not aware of, and what's going to be his outcome? Verse 51. And he shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Do you see that? Two servants. And the outcome is based on what they do. And that evil servant who commits that wickedness, his outcome is weeping and gnashing of teeth. He's cast into hellfire. Look at Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25, again, these are some of these stories and parables that trip people up, but they're not to the church. They're not church age doctrine. These involve the time of Jacob's trouble. All right, look at uh, verse 1. Then shall the, watch it, don't miss it, then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took the oil in their vessels with the lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil. For our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so. Let there be enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they were went to buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready went in with him to the marriage. And the door was shut. Afterward came also the Lord, I'm sorry, afterward came also the other virgin, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour when the Son of Man cometh. Listen, you can't miss that that story there is conditional. It's conditional on being ready for when the Son of Man cometh. And five of those virgins were ready, and five of those virgins weren't ready. Listen, that's not you and I. It doesn't matter if you're ready or not. When the Lord comes, he calls you by name. You're going home. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. But that's why people have a conditional rapture. They read it here. They don't understand it's time of Jacob's trouble. And there are going to be people that are going to be left out of the marriage because they were not ready. Let me give you one more. Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. Again, Hebrews, you should just know by the name itself. It's to the Hebrews. <laughs> I know that's profound. Now listen, you as a Gentile, before you got saved, you didn't care anything about the law. You didn't care anything about the sacrifices. You didn't care anything about the priesthood. But you know who needs to be convinced that those things are true? The Jew. Because right now, they don't accept the, the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. But in the time of Jacob's trouble, their eyes are going to be open and they're going to read here in the book of Hebrews and they'll come to that understanding. Now, it doesn't mean there's not truth in there for us. Of course, there's truth in there for, for us. Look at Hebrews chapter 6, though. Hebrews chapter 6. Just for time's sake, we'll start at verse 4. The Bible says, if, I'm sorry, for, for it is possible... For those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. 
Which is sound like someone, if you apply to us, that's someone who's saved, right? <laughs> They're partakers, they taste the heavenly gifts, so on and so forth, partakers of the heavenly ghost. Look at verse 5. And have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. Here we go, look at verse 6. If they shall fall away to renew them again under repentance, seeing they crucified themselves, the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. So let me reread verse 4 because I read it wrong. For it is impossible. So I should have said, I knew it wasn't making sense in my brain. For it is impossible. So listen to me. If someone's listening tonight and they believe they can lose their salvation, Hebrews 6 says it's impossible for you to get it back. Do you know when that doesn't apply? To you and I. Do you know when it does apply? In the time of Jacob's trouble. If that Hebrew, if that Jew takes the mark of the beast. It is impossible for them to renew themselves. It is impossible if they receive that to go to heaven. All right? Now, let's, let's go on. Look at uh, Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. This is a very important point. I know I'm, I'm uh, going long, but stay with me. We're almost done. Again, Consider that the implication is if you put the church one day into the tribulation. And again, I've said this already. If you put the church one day into the tribulation, then you are going to destroy the doctrines of salvation and those doctrines that are connected to salvation like eternal security. Look at Revelation chapter 13. This is in regards to, to a man who takes the mark of the beast. Look at Revelation chapter 13. All right, let's skip down to verse 16. It's talking over there again about the, that beast, the dragon there. It says, and he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. You say, who's got to do that? He tells you. He required them all to do it. Look at the next verse. That no man might buy or sell, save that he had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. This is going to go on in the time of Jacob's trouble. Now look what happens. Look at Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14. Look what happens to any man, any woman, any person who takes that mark. Revelation chapter 14. Look at verse 9. And the, third, and the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God which is poured out without mixture in the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. You say, who does that apply to? Any person who receives the mark, they are damned there's nothing they can do. And it doesn't matter if they profess the name of Christ or not. Any man, they're going to face that wrath of God. Look at Revelation chapter 16. Revelation chapter 16. And I heard a great voice, verse 1, out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials, watch it, of the wrath of God upon the earth. Who are these angels going to pour out the wrath of God on? Look at verse 2. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a, fell a newsome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. Again, you take the mark of the beast, that angel's going to come out and pour out the wrath of God on you. Look at Revelation chapter 19. Revelation 19, you can't miss it. I guess you could miss it if you don't read the Bible. Revelation 19. 
Verse 19. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken with him, with the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshiped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Again, we see judgment upon all those that take the mark. Now look at this in contrast to those that overcame the, the Antichrist. Look at Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. Watch it. And for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Again, the Bible is very clear. Those in the days of Jacob's trouble, they take the mark, they're damned. And those that overcome are those that did not love their life unto death and they refused to take the mark. And, and all that goes back to the promises that we read that Paul said in 1 Corinthians, I'm sorry, 1 Thessalonians. He said there that God has not appointed us unto wrath. He said a second time, God has delivered us from the wrath to come. You say, from what wrath? Now, some people like to just say it's the wrath of God. That's not what the verse has said. He's delivered us from the wrath of Satan. He's delivered us from the wrath of the angels that have the wrath of God. And he's delivered us from the wrath of God. He's delivered us from all wrath. Now, again, let me close out this point. This point is this. If the church goes into the time of Jacob's trouble, into the tribulation, we know the Antichrist, He's going to set up power. He's going to be a world leader. He's going to start making people take the mark of the beast. Well, if you go into the tribulation, Christian, what happens to you if you take the mark of the beast? According to the Bible, not according to what you say. According to the Bible, if any man take the mark of the beast, so you don't have to be there when God starts pouring his wrath on during the time of the great tribulation. If you're just there during the first three and a half years and the mark of the beast is instituted and you could take it, you would lose your salvation. And we know that's not possible. It violates the promises of God. And that's why the church has to be raptured before the tribulation. I hear folks all the time say this thing is, again, this kind of redundant, but it's worth repeating. Well, true believers yeah. won't take the mark. No yeah, yeah. Well, if they're really saved, they won't take the mark. I like what Brother Donovan says. And, and again, I promise, I know I said this about four times. I'm taking note from Paul. Finally, brethren, I'm almost done. But this is important. The whole thing's been important. I like what Brother Donovan says on this matter. He says, so we are to believe that under grace with no pressure of life or death on him today. A saint of God can commit all kinds of sins and still be saved. But if one is saved during the tribulation period and he will not commit these sins, and I'm sorry, and he won't commit these sins and endure unto the end, waiting for the coming of Christ. He's saying, basically what I said, you're going you're gonna to tell me that during the day and age we live in, listen, folks, just think of Christians you know that profess the name of Christ. And you're going to tell me that during the time of tribulation, all of a sudden, everyone's going to be a super Christian? No. People are going to take the mark of the beast. And this brings me to my last point. What is eternal security? See, people have the wrong idea about eternal security. But when you have the biblical understanding of what eternal security is, you'll see why there's such an emphasis not to put the church one day into the tribulation. As I just told you, for obvious reasons. 
If you're one day in the tribulation and you take the mark of the beast, you're going to be damned. And listen to me, ladies and gentlemen, that's not eternal security. Now, I know people don't like this, but there is nothing I could do today to lose my salvation. Did you hear what I said? There's nothing I could do today to lose my salvation. You know why? That's eternal security. You say, why, preacher? Because I don't stand in my own righteousness. I stand in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It's he that keeps me. It's not my good life that keeps me. It's him we're trusting in the finished work of Jesus Christ. So all those who want to rest this scripture to their destruction, not a single one of them will answer this question. What if a believer in the tribulation, a saint in the tribulation, took the mark of the beast? Would they be damned? You know why even my fellow Bible believers won't answer that question? Because they know the answer. If any man, if any man take the mark, then he's damned. And ladies and gentlemen, that is not eternal security. Eternal security means there's nothing you could do to lose it. And again, this is why it's such a near and precious doctrine of the church, one worth standing for, one worth fighting for, because ladies and gentlemen, we know the exceeding and precious promises of the word of God, and there's nothing you could do to lose it. But at the time of Jacob's trouble, if any man takes it, then he is damned. And guess what he's going to get? He's going to face the wrath of Almighty God. And that means if he only lived in the first three and a half or lived the whole time, if he takes it at all, he's going to face the wrath of God. Ladies and gentlemen, if you can just grasp that, that will destroy this new popular idea about the pre-wrath rapture where they have the church going through the tribulation, so they say, and raptured right before the wrath of God. Again, why that's impossible is because the mark of the beast is going to be instituted before that. And if you receive that mark, then you're damned. And that means a Christian would face the wrath of God despite God's promise for us that he's delivered, it, delivered us from the wrath to come. And amen. And we're not appointed unto wrath. One more point with the study. We'll do it in a couple of weeks. And again, I, it worked out well. Good night to, to have a little bit extended time. So we'll close out in a word of prayer. And I'm going uh, to ask Brother Gary to, to uh, close us in prayer, ask the Lord to bless the food. And then we have a couple hours, and we'll meet back here in 1030. So, Brother Gary, you mind closing out? Dear Heavenly Father, once again, we do thank you, God, for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God, we, we, we know we're unworthy of salvation, Father, but you saw fit to send your Son, Father, and, and save us. Lord, we're thankful, God, for uh, all you've done for us. We're thankful, God, that we do have eternal security in the Father. We just pray, God, that, uh, again, that you bless uh, uh, everything that happens here tonight, Father. We pray that you bless all these men that have prepared messages and preaching and singing and everything that we'll do this evening, Father. We pray, God, that you bless uh, the time of fellowship we can have one with another. Bless this food, God. Use it to nourish our bodies, Lord. We're thankful for all those that prepared it. And uh, again, uh, we just uh, thank you for all you've done for us. And we ask these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 You are dismissed. We're on break. <laughs>